The next item of business is debate on motion 14194 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on Women and Girls in Sport Week. Can I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to speak to and move the motion for up to 13 minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to start by acknowledging the great and many successes we've seen at the highest level in women's sport this year. The success of Scottish women's national football team in getting to the World Cup 2019 finals in France, the success of athletes such as Laura Muir and Eilish McCogan at the European Championships, and the many fantastic performances by female athletes at the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games. These are all defining moments for women and girls in sport across the country, and thank you to all of these fantastic role models. I'm absolutely clear about the benefits of sport and physical activity. My ministerial portfolio, public health, sport and well-being, signifies a deliberate, clear and connected approach that exploits the benefits of physical activity and sport to improve the health of the people of Scotland. I'm more convinced than ever of this um, as I've seen firsthand the powerful force that sport and physical activity can play in transforming people and communities. We want to create a culture in which healthy behaviours are the norm throughout people's lives. Only by doing that can we achieve the Scottish Government's vision of a Scotland where more people are more active more often. And sport has an important role to play. As well as, <clears throat> as, as you'll be well aware, in Scotland we've developed a world-class uh, sporting system at all levels, connecting sport in schools and education, club and community sport, and of course, performance sport. Through our investment in facilities, we're providing participation opportunities for people and communities across Scotland. Since 2007, Sport Scotland has invested some £168 million in supporting local clubs, local authorities, sports governing bodies and other organisations delivering a wide range of new and upgraded sports facilities. And this is all about behavioural change. In order for children from all backgrounds um, to benefit um, and have access to sport and physical activity, the government has in invested £11.6 million in supporting schools to meet our PE commitment of two hours or periods per week. That's up from 10% in 2004-05 to 98% in 2016, so real success there. Um, and that's backed by up to £50 million to be invested in active schools between 2015 and 2019. Figures published in September showed an uptake in the active school programme with 7.3 million participant sessions delivered in 2017-18. That's an increase of 6% from the previous year. 44% of the female school role participated in active schools in 2017-18. 2% increase from the previous year. So that 147,655 females made up 48% of the active schools distinct participants in 2017-18, representing a 7,604 increase on the previous year. So although 48% is, is not 52% as it probably should be, so, so although more young men um, than women are taking, still taking part in active schools overall, the trend uh, reverses for leadership opportunities where more young women than young men take part in Sports Scotland supported leadership opportunities um, as we see within the application for the membership of Sports Scotland Young People Sports Panels. These leadership opportunities help to build strong mo role models and inspire other girls and young women. In our 192 community sports hubs across the world, there are nearly 56,000 females, female playing members. 27% of community sport hub coaches are female, which I think picks up uh, a point that uh, Alison Johnson was making in, in, in her um, amendment, which was, was, was not, su not selected. Um, it is progress, but clearly we have a distance to go. So over 55,000 uh, women and girls um, members of, of those uh, community sports hubs, which are embedded in our community. The programme is only made possible by an army of over 19,000 volunteers who deliver sport and physical activity in their communities. 
This government accepted, accepts we have work to do and we're committed to do more to encourage women and girls to participate in sport. The number of women and girls taking part in a wide variety of sport and physical activity has increased over recent years. That includes significant progress in recreational walking, netball, hockey, cycling, basketball, rugby and shinty. We've also seen physical activity levels among teenage girls increasing. However, we recognise there is still much to do to increase participation and raise awareness across the sector to remove the barriers some still face when it comes to getting involved in sport and physical activity. The Scottish Government, um, in recognising that challenge, established the Women and Girls in Sport Advisory Board to help us understand what more we could do to increase opportunities for every woman and girl in Scotland and raise awareness across the media and business sectors. So as part of the Women and Girls in Sports uh, Board's um, work um, has been to uh, form the Women in, and Girls in Sports Week 2018, which this debate is part of. The week provides the opportunity to promote and celebrate women and girls in sport and my ministerial colleagues and I will be undertaking a range of activities across the country to raise the profile of the week and to encourage more women and girls to take part in sport, to try out new sports, to build um, in a more regular physical activity to their everyday lives. There's a huge range of activities already this week. I've been able to join uh, some women from Edinburgh in, in tennis. Um, on Friday, I will be joining some uh, women in, uh, in taking part in football and on fr uh, Friday uh, night I will be um, attending Dundee Ice Arena to, 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 to see some of the women and girls who are taking part in, 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 in ice skating uh, there. So a really important part and maybe next, next year we need to widen that out so that more members um, from across the, the chamber can take part in that. As part of that week I, I was very pleased to be able to announce a 300 £1,000 national fund to support projects encouraging female participation. Funding awards will, will range from between £10,000 and £30,000, building on the 2017 Sporting Equality Fund that was um, awarded to projects such as wheelchair uh, basketball in Glasgow, netball across Scotland and um, bikepacking adventures in the Highlands. The continuation of that fund um, that of funding for that, this type of projects will continue to help encourage the inactive and encourage them into uh, physical activity. I think um, everyone um, must agree that um, there is a lot of really good work going on across, across Scotland. And I'm, I'm really pleased that as, a, as I've gone uh, uh, around the country in, in the three and maybe nearly four months now since I became sports minister, um, the understanding of the importance of physical activity um, and, and sport to people's physical and mental health is embedded right across our sporting community at every level. One of the first um, sporting events I, I was um, honoured to be able to take part in was the Euro Championships and the great thing for me as new sports minister was that I was able to engage with and meet um, lots of people, some at the, at the highest level of European sport and from every single one of our fantastic um, uh, governing bodies in Scotland understood the importance of getting people involved in sport at the grassroots level for the success of their sports going forward and on and, and every occasion they understood the importance of, of getting women involved in sport and girls involved in sport as part of that. I've attended um, a, a large number of uh, community sports hubs where I've seen um, traditional, sometimes traditional um, male sports clubs who have grasped the thistle and accepted that they need to do more to encourage women into their sport, into their clubs, whether by extending the range of, of sports on, on offer. And I've seen football clubs who've um, gone out with their comfort zone to um, encompass uh, women's boxing, um, which in, in some areas is, is been really successful in encouraging um, some uh, women and girls who are otherwise uh, disconnected from the normal sporting um, environment um, into sport. They've found it really exciting. They don't always take part in the competitive part of sport, but I don't think that matters. So we've got women and girls coming to, to join a boxing club in order to do the training, then that's what's most important. Some of them will probably possibly go on to, to be part of, of competitive sport, but I don't think that's the primary objective here for me. I think if we can encourage more people at 
all levels, particularly women and girls in, in this week to engage in sport, then we will naturally find um, more people um, moving through into the higher levels of sport, moving from um, recreational sport into club sport and, and, and some on up, up the, of course. Rachel Hamilton. Thank you for taking the intervention. Um, I was a former um, voluntary um, netball coach and umpire, and one of the biggest barriers that I found um, for the girls that were in the club, it was an all-female club, uh, was, um, you, I mean, you, you did say that actually all women don't need to go into competitive sport, but ultimately that happens if a woman is quite good at sport. So in this circumstance, some of the girls actually uh, couldn't get the transport, so the school had to fund the bus, um, we had to take a small fee for the club, um, we had to get somebody that could drive and um, very often the teacher wasn't available to drive the bus and we weren't qualified to drive the bus. So we found that actually we had to sometimes turn down that competitive edge um, in order to, because of the transport issues that we had. Joe Fitzpatrick. I think the, mem the members makes um, an important point that we need to understand if there are barriers to people participating, whether it's um, from um, women, women and girls or people from deprived areas. We need to understand those barriers and try and break them down because it is so important that we get folk involved in, in sport. Um, netball is, is incidentally one of the sports where we've seen a real uptake in so that the kind of work that, that, that um, Sport Scotland has been uh, leading on um, is, um, has been encouraging um, seen a, an uplift in, in participation in netball so that's that's a one particular area where we've got a really good success story but we do need to understand if there are barriers to people um, and women and girls in particular to taking part in sport that we need to understand with it what they are and, and see if we can find ways around that and we'll only do that in partnership with our partners and um, whether that's sports scotland local authorities and um, schools we need we need to understand what the barriers are so that we can take that forward so the member makes a, a good point um coming to a conclusion um this is a, a really important year. It's been a really positive year for, for women's sport this year, and I look forward to a huge year for women in sport in 2019, with the major events taking place to inspire the nation through Scotland hosting the Euro Under-19s uh, Football Championships and hosting the pre prestigious Solheim Cup at Glen Eagles. We can also look forward to uh, roaring on our women's uh, football team as they head over to France for the FIFA World Cup. Um, presiding officer, in uh, moving my motion, the motion in my name, I, I want to confirm that I will be supporting the amendments from Brian Whittle and Anna Sarwar, um, and we would have supported the amendment in the name of Alison Johnson because I think she, she makes some important points, which um, is, is something which I think Sports Scotland have identified and are trying to address. So, um, thank you very much. I now call Brian Whittle to speak to and move amendment. 14194.1 for up to eight minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to open this uh, girls and women in sport debate on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives, and we will be supporting the Scottish Government motion, of course, because it has uh, very laudable aims, uh, and, and we will also support the Labour amendment. I think I was thinking of how I would I, I would look at sort of how women's in sport has developed uh, over the years. Uh, the name at Maruicha Puicha came into my mind, as, as I was sure it was everybody else's. Uh, I would be more than impressed if, if uh, a number of members uh, knew who I was talking about here. But if I mentioned uh, Zola Budd and Mary Decker Slaney, I think probably more members would recognise uh, the, the race that I'm talking about, because uh, in that race, Mariwika Puika won the Olympic uh, 3000 metre title as, as the two of them clashed. Why am I mentioning that? Well, because in 1984 Olympic Games, the 3000 metres was the longest race that women were allowed to participate on on the track. And that isn't that far, uh, that isn't that, that long ago. And so they didn't have the 5000, they didn't have the 10,000, they didn't have the, the 20 kilometre walk or the 50 kilometre kilometer walk, they didn't have the pole vault, they didn't have the triple jump, they didn't have the hammer, and, and now we look forward to where we are now, and we nearly, nearly have parity uh, in the Olympic Games. The only one that's now missing uh, is the 50, 50 uh, kilometre walk. I also just thought I'd mention that uh, Wendy Sly won the silver in that particular, that particular race as well, it's a, it's a good friend of mine. I think that the, the, these days, though, the predominantly, which is quite interesting for me in Scottish, the Scottish athletics terms, and I uh, unashamedly am going to talk about athletics, um, it's the women who dominate. 
uh, was already mentioned uh, by the Minister, uh, Laura Muir and, uh, uh, and Elise McColgan. But we also have to talk about Ailey Doyle, who's, who's uh, I think this year has now reached uh, a record 18 major medals. Uh, and, and now young Zoe Clark, who I've mentioned before, is, is coming in behind uh, Ailey Doyle and, 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 and long may that continue. And there are, uh, I, was at, um, I, I was at the uh, National uh, Training uh, Squad day a couple of weeks ago, and there are a number of, of uh, young athletes coming up behind them. But um, what I did, Alison Johnson, I know I, I, we, had a, we had a conversation about this. One of the things that did strike me at that, uh, at that uh, event was the lack of numbers of women coaches uh, that were there. It was, it was a, national, uh, a national squad day with all the athletes, and I counted a grand total of one female coach. So I think that's something we, ha we, we are going to have to ta uh, take cognizance of. I think if we are going to look at how we break down the barriers of bringing more uh, uh, girls and women into sport, we have to think about uh, uh, the coaches who, who lead them in there. Because um, the minister and I attended a, a, a function on, uh, on, on Tuesday there, and we listened to some young, uh, young women telling of their experiences of how they got into sport. And, and the, what kept coming back to me was school, was teachers, was parents and coaches. These are the people that are influencing uh, our athletes. And uh, I think that if we can, we, we start to not just look at parity in terms of, of women taking part in sport, but the parity of women who are actually coaching sport and being involved in sport. I think that that's something that might help to break, break down those barriers. And that, the other thing that came out for me was I said at, at that particular one was, was the continually talking about school. School is going to, ha is going to be uh, a, a place, where, uh, a, place where, where a lot of children get their first uh, experiences of sport. And I've long been an advocate that what we should be doing is, is taking sport and activity to our children rather than and waiting for them uh, to come to, to sport. So I think in schools we have that opportunity and I think we have to uh, consider that as, that as a major environment uh, where we have, to, we have to, to enhance. I think that um, when we look at school sport, I think we now start to, we have to start looking at, at how we link that to, to extracurricular activity and into to community activities. Because when I look at the, sc the school PE curriculum, I don't see the point of doing six weeks of an introductory course to any sport if there is then not a destination for that sport outside of school. Because if, you, if you're going to enthuse, enthuse a child to, to participate uh, in sport, you have to give them a destination. So I think. When we're, when, we're, when we're looking at the physical education program, I'd like to see a, bit, a degree of flexibility in that that, that, that takes cognizance of what's available uh, around, around the school uh, to, to further that, that sort of physical, physical development, that physical education. Of course. Gillian Martin. Thank you very much for, for taking my intervention. I want to make a point around some of the extracurricular uh, school um, um, sports programs that go on. Often they beca can become quite competitive and the first children that maybe don't, aren't, don't excel in the sport can also feel excluded. They actually enjoy doing the sport, but they feel excluded because they become quite competitive. Would you agree with me that it's important that sport's for all, not just those that actually naturally excel at it? Ryan Whittle. Thank you. Uh, can I thank the member for that intervention and actually lead nicely on to my next point was, was how, we, how we create that, that, uh, that pathway and, des and, and, and destination of sport. I think when we look at sport, we often look at a uh, destination as being at the very top end of sport. We look at international, uh, international sport as, as when you come in at the bottom, that's where we're heading. But of course, there are many stops on that journey on the way along. And, and as the member says, sports, sports fun. Sport is for, for enjoyment. I, I think actually what we should be doing is looking at what we're doing in, in the nursery program. I think that's where we should be starting. I think that active play within, uh, within nursery. And we have, this, we have this program now where we're going to have 30 hours uh, of, of um, uh, free nursery care, which is ostensibly there to, uh, to help parents get back to work. But in my view, I think we've got 30 hours. We have 30 hours. What? I will always take an intervention from Marie Todd. Marie Todd. 
Can I just correct you there, Mr Whittle, the purpose of the expansion in early years in childcare is absolutely about improving the attainment gap, closing it before it ever occurs, before it's apparent at school. You're right, 30 hours is an incredible opportunity to define a different kind of learning, and outdoor <coughs> learning, I hope, very passionately, which naturally is child-led and play-based and gives children lots of physical skills. I hope will be a very core part of the new offering that we have in Scotland. Brian Mitchell. Suited to chastise, I come back to my feet. But uh, yeah, I, I, well, I, th I, think, I think we are actually agreeing that, that it gives you an opportunity to have that, that development and that active play and that physical literacy. And then I think then when you go into primary school, you, that develops into games, into play, that, that, those, that sort of play. And as you go into secondary school, you have that option of, of, of taking that, that sort of literacy into other sports if you want. And there are many, many uh, um, uh, uh, examples of sports out there where uh, um, participation in that sport doesn't mean competitiveness. And, I, and I've, I've talked many times about um, uh, uh, Sam Mullen at, at uh, the Dune Valley Boxing Club, where he has he has revolutionised the way that that community uh, 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 is seen. And and majority of the kids that turn up at that uh, at that boxing club are not competitive. They go along there to enjoy uh, enjoy. So. Um, I will go straight to the end of my, <laughs> end of my, my speech, if I could. Uh, the, the, one, the one thing I wanted to do in, in supporting the Labour Amendment, I wanted to quote um, Anna Kessel, um, who um, they said that this, this uh, and I quote that uh, the schools with kids facing the biggest academic hurdles are often those facing the biggest cuts in their PE programme, and often those are the kids for whom extracurricular sport clubs are not an option. So when it comes to physical education, school is their lifeline. So little wonder then that the privately educated athletes are overrepresented over in the Team GB medal tally, with one third of Britain's medalists at the Rio 2016 Games have attended a fee-paying school. So can I say, in conclusion, uh, we will of course support the Scottish Government's motion this evening in recognising the development of women's sport over the years and continue to celebrate those achievements. And in doing so, presiding officer, uh, we must also recognise that there are a section of society that in many cases have less opportunity than their male counterparts, and that inequality of opportunity exists in many groups in our society, and our aim should be to have an equal opportunity irrespective of background or personal circumstance, and I move the amendment in my name. I call Anna Sarwar to speak to and move amendment 14194.2 for up to seven minutes, please. Senior officer, I move the amendment in my name. This is an important debate and I welcome the Scottish Government's motion, both in content and tone. It's important not because of what we see in here, but because of the importance of involving more women and girls in sport and physical activity. Because the reality is, and it's a long-standing issue, not one just for this government, but for previous governments too, it is a tough nut to crack. And that there is still a huge disparity between those participation levels of women and girls with those of men and boys. And while there are very close similarities in participation rates in early years, those levels sadly move apart significantly and over a short period of time from around the age of 11 or 12. From about that age onward, the gap is intolerably large. And between the ages of 11 to 12 and then 13 to 15, the level of participation drops by a third amongst girls, but only by 1% amongst boys of the same age. Just half the number of girls aged 13 to 15 meet the recommended physical activity guidelines compared to boys of the same age. And in the 16 to 24 age range, 9 out of 10 uh, men uh, get the guidelines, while only 6 out of 10 women did so. And even in the oldest age range, one third of men met the guidelines compared to only one out of five women. Addressing that participation gap is why this debate is so important. And that's partly why a dedicated Women and Girls in Sports Week is so important too. The benefits of participating in sport and physical activity are well documented and well recognised from the obvious physical health benefits and the role physical activity plays in tackling weight related health problems such as obesity to the role physical activity also plays in promoting mental well-being. I'm told it also helps you sleep better and improves your mood too. I can tell lots of members in this chamber including myself don't get enough exercise but there are many benefits to being active. Uh, and the continued focus, as it is now, should be on early years activity. Presenting officer, if a child is inactive, it is much more likely that a child will grow into an inactive adult. But exposing children to enjoyable sport or physical activities at a young age means it is much more likely that a child will continue those activities into and through adulthood. 
particularly if the child is involved with a club while still at school. Uh, they are then much more likely to remain at a club level member after leaving school. Uh, that is why I welcome the Scottish Government's continued support for the Active Schools programme. Um, it was started by Labour almost 15 years ago and it has supported pupils uh, to enjoy a huge range of activities and supported thousands of volunteers into volunteering in sport. Uh, and while in recent years there's been a small shift in participation rates, it's clear there is still a long way to go. Our own amendment recognises the success but I have to say to the Minister gently, and this is not a party political point, far from it, because I recognise that in fact on all political parties and all previous governments too, that progress has been very limited. And it does concern me that we are still not making sufficient progress quickly enough in this area. Our own amendment also recognises the link between poverty levels. Of course, happy to. Brian Whittle. Yeah, can I thank Anna Sawar uh, for taking that intervention. In, in, in supporting your amendment, I was, uh, which I didn't say in there, I was, what I was considering was if you look at the, the health budget, it's £13 billion, and you look at the sports budget, £29 million, the reason we haven't made the progress is we haven't, ha we haven't got the finance to, to, to upscale uh, the, some of the good work that's been done out there. Anna Sarver. I, I think Brian Whittle makes a, a fair point. The other point I make is it's the National Health Service rather than the National Ill Health Service. So we want a National Health Service that helps promote health and well-being, so actually save money uh, in the longer term uh, as well, and also allow people to live longer healthier, happier and more active um, lives. Um, as I said, our own amendment recognises the link between poverty levels and the levels of physical activity. Uh, participation rates among women in the least deprived areas are 50% uh, higher than those in the most deprived areas. A staggering difference, a 50% difference between the least and most deprived areas. Uh, participating in sport can come with a hefty price tag too, uh, be it for clothing, or equipment or even venue hire. Not every family can afford to pay the 40 or 50 pounds it is for a five-a-side football pitch, for example, eh, on one evening eh, during the week. Um, and that's why we have to look at how we can have eh, affordable or free access to sport. Eh, and not only are we seeing lower levels of women and girls participating, over, over, participating overall, we are seeing those levels depressing even further due to the impact eh, of poverty. It's partly for this reason that I do hope the government, uh, and as the Minister set out, will be supporting our amendment today, uh, recognising that poverty is a key determining factor in levels of physical activity. It's crucial in how we address the issues in future, particularly through the provision of free and affordable sport, as I said before, but also about how we look at a diverse range of sports uh, for women and girls to get active into. The fastest growing sport in Scotland is actually women's football. Uh, how we encourage more diverse sports so we can say to any woman and girl that no sport is inaccessible to them. But we should also look at what we do with the consequences from the UK-wide sugar tax. I think that money should be going into access to provision uh, of free sport, but that's perhaps a debate uh, for another day. And the final reason why I'm pleased the government will support our amendment is the recognition of the part role models can play in encouraging and inspiring others. And in women's football, we have the fantastic success of the Scottish women's football team in reaching the World Cup finals in France next year. Uh, Alec McLeish was here last week uh, for show race on the red card uh, photo call uh, and he was quick to highlight the success of the women's team and only pray that we have the same success for the men's team uh, as well. Uh, and I warmly welcome the First Minister's announcement of support for the women's team in its preparations for the tournament. I also overheard uh, the Scotland manager asking the First Minister for a similar commitment if the men's team qualify for the World Cup uh, too. Uh, and I'm sure everyone wishes them well, uh, both the women's team and the men's team, uh, in those efforts. President Officer, there is good work going on across Scotland, uh, in schools, in communities and in clubs to help reduce the gender gap, pay gap, the gender gap, I'm used to the pay gap, sorry, uh, the gender gap, there's a pay gap as well, which is also an extremely <laughs> serious issue, we're probably a debate for a, a, another day, perhaps connected, uh, but also we should recognise the role of the third sector as well, the third sector do a huge role in our communities, and I'm concerned that despite these good efforts, the gap remains stubbornly wide, uh, so perhaps when the Minister gets the opportunity today, he can say what more the Scottish Government thinks can be done and how we can measure that impact in the future so that in 10 years' time, we're not still talking about a stubborn gender gap and still talking about women and girls in Sports Week. Instead, we're talking about having successfully closed that gap and that women and girls of all ages and all backgrounds are enjoying the many benefits sports and physical activity has to offer. And I'll say finally, in closing, uh, Deputy Planning Officer, in any endeavour the government makes in this regard, they will have our full support. Call Alison Johnson for up to six minutes, please. 
Thank you, presiding officer. Um, I'd like to draw attention to my register of interests. I'm really pleased to be taking part in this debate this afternoon. I think this is a subject that needs greater focus. Um, I really welcome Women and Girls in Sport Week and thank those organisations who have provided briefings. Um, I'd like to thank Sports Scotland and I'd also like to thank the Edinburgh Mavericks Corfball Club. Um, this is a sport where uh, the team is made up of four men and four women and three female players will be competing in the European Corfball Championships in the Netherlands from the 12th to the 21st of October. That's three women players from Edinburgh. Um, so it's absolutely right that we recognise and celebrate the work that is being undertaken to properly understand what the gap in participation in sport is, why that gap exists, and the action that's being taken to close the gap. Um, you know, why do some young women turn away from competitive sport? Why do some young women never get involved in the first place? And of course, as Anna Sarwar has said, boys drop out too, but far more of them don't. And what are the implications of this gendered non-participation? So I'm really pleased we're discussing this issue. I think we have much more to learn and understand. But when we consider that, according to research by women in sport in their stats report of 2017, that coverage of women's sport makes up 7% of all sports media, coverage in, this is coverage in the UK, just over 10% of televised sports coverage is dedicated to women's sport, just 2% of national newspaper sports coverage is dedicated to women's sport. 5% of radio sports coverage is dedicated to women's sport. And 4% of online sports coverage is dedicated to women's sport. I actually think it's pretty incredible that the gap isn't much wider. You know, we're hearing literally nothing when we look at this, uh, to look at that balance there. And of course, some of the spaces that sport takes place in are very masculinized, very masculinized indeed. Now, we know that physical inactivity is one of the leading risk factors of death globally. Professor Nanette Moutry, when she was giving evidence in the Parliament to the Health and Sport Committee, said, the evidence to be active is very solid and can't be ignored. For example, physical inactivity is more harmful than smoking. Now, that's, that's Professor Nanette Moutry saying that to us. Now, I think this Parliament has shown that it can be really bold when it acts to improve public health. I'm really proud of the action the Parliament took in preventing smoking in public places. The evidence was clear that smoking was a leading cause of disease and premature death and Parliament acted. And we need to get bold when it comes to physical inactivity. And I appreciate that the, the issue of physical inactivity is a broader one than that of the low rates of women and girls taking part in sport, but these issues are very closely related. I was pleased to learn via the Scottish Household Survey that people have become more active. We know that participation is greater among those who are more highly qualified. We know that participation is lowest in the most deprived areas. And I was really privileged to host the wonderful Paths for All Awards last week in Parliament, a truly memorable evening that the Minister enjoyed too, and one that demonstrated that the benefits of walking go way beyond physical health. I can't, walk, I can't commend walking enough. Um, the, the Minister said it doesn't all have to be about competition, but if you want to... Um, you know, take up the step count challenge, Minister. Well, it begins on the, 20, the 29th of October. We'll see how we get on there. And um, Walking does really well in terms of gender equality, with 69% of men and 71% of women taking part in recreational walking. That's recreational walking that's soon going to become very competitive. Um, but we do know that if we take walking out of the equation, then just over half of adults take part in physical activity. And we see that far more men participate uh, than women in physical, in sporting activities, as Anna Sarwar mentioned. So, uh, you know, the, the impact of habit beginning early in life can't be overstated. In her PhD thesis on everyday geographies of girls' experiences of physical activity, gender, health and bodies, Dr Morgan Windrum Geddes, who has been in this parliament speaking to the cross-party group on children and young people, she pointed out that policy is concerned with children's bodies in respect to weight, fat and obesity, and to what children can and should do to decrease their body's weights to satisfy health policy. And she comes to the, the conclusion that the way to improve girls' participation in sport is to get away from this obsession with weight and to begin to focus more on enjoyment. She writes that girls' experiences are multiple and diverse. An activity which one girl enjoyed was loathed by another girl. 
Having to wear white t-shirts and black shorts for PE kit was hated by one girl, but not given a thought, another thought by a different girl. Doing PE with the boys was reflected on positively by some girls and met with fear and anxiety by others. Girls and women face particular balance, barriers and challenges in engaging with sport. Um, I think this, this obsession with women's bodies, their fitness otherwise, you know, this, this focus on the need to appear on the beach in a bikini, um, it, it's become regarded as completely normal. I don't see many, you know, magazine covers selling themselves with, with pictures of, of men in or out of their bathing shorts pre or after an exercise <laughs> programme. So I, I think we have to change this focus. Um, I, I do think play has an essential role to play here. The cost of access to sports centres has been mentioned. Absolutely. There should be a cost beyond which we cannot go at a national level. The access to some sports centres in this city, quite frankly, is, is prohibitive. We've seen some really good work in specific sports. Um, obviously, um, myself, um, you know, I've been involved in athletics all my life, and I think we are a particularly good brand with a very good strong story to, to sell when it comes to that. Other sports are beginning to catch up, but I'd like to, us to come back to this chamber perhaps next year and look to ensure that this gap has closed markedly. Still much more to do, but looking forward to working with colleagues to achieve this. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Lee MacArthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, there are many high points of being Orkney's MSP, but I have to say, as a sporting fanatic, being asked to co-host Orkney's Sports Person of the Year over the last couple of years has been right up there. Uh, BBC Radio Orkney's uh, Robbie Fraser does, uh, does a good Des Lynham to my poor man's Gary Lineker. Anyway, we've, we've bagged the gig again uh, for next year, proving that we must be doing something right or just being cheap as a clincher. Uh, but at the most recent awards, I was delighted but not at all surprised when the shortlist for the top individual award was made up of three of Orkney's highly impressive young female athletes. Hannah Bevan, already a Scottish powerlifting champion, uh, who earlier this summer announced herself as a British record holder in the 47 kg category. Sarah McPhail, who stormed her way through the various development pathways in netball, netball uh, to the point where she'll captain Scotland's under-21 team at Netball Europe uh, uh, competition in Belfast this weekend, and hopefully stake a claim uh, for being in the full Scotland squad for the World Cup next year. Uh, and then there was the eventual winner, Anna Tate, whose victory was sealed on the back of a season that saw her smash records on the track uh, at the International Island Games in Gotland, uh, compete for Scotland at 1,500 metres and perform well in the GB trials. All three, Hannah, Sarah and Anna, share the same commitment, tenacity and determination to make the very most of their talents. And this was no flash in the pan. Anna Tate's predecessor as Orkney's Sports Person of the Year is Rachel Sutherland, who has captained Scotland to success at the European Pool Championships and was recently selected in Scotland's A squad for the World Finals next month. These, of course, are young women operating at or near the top of their respective sports. And I appreciate that the focus of Women and Girls in Sport Week may be more about encouraging and supporting participation at grassroots levels, about unlocking the benefits that we've heard about uh, that come with playing uh, sport and being physically active. Uh, health benefits, of course, both physical and, as Anna Sawa reminded us, mental health as well. Also, the benefits of the skills of teamwork, of, of, of perseverance, of communication, and the self-confidence that comes from that. All invaluable in a sporting context, at whatever level, but skills that stand any individual in good stead, whatever they choose to do, uh, in return, uh, benefiting wider society. But as uh, Anna Sawa's uh, amendment underlines, uh, I think uh, that having the role, mod role models is absolutely key to our efforts uh, to, to, to encourage the greater uptake of sport and physical activity, providing examples for young girls or those indeed of all ages uh, to look up to and be inspired by. And this can, of course, be the Laura Muirs, the Eve Muirheads, and frankly, the entire Scotland football, uh, women's football team, uh, whose exploits, along with others, have undoubtedly inspired a nation. But when you see those inspirational people within your own community, it's perhaps even more tangible and powerful. Easier to say, well, why not me? So that link between grassroots and elite sport is crucial. It isn't a question of investing in one and not in the other. Failures to do both will inevitably undermine our chances of achieving our ambitions or allowing each individual to fulfill their potential, whatever that may be. 
I know from speaking to Rachel Sutherland that she takes very seriously her role in supporting other girls and young women and has enjoyed real success with numbers competing regularly up threefold over recent years. But being a woman in a male-dominated sport like pool is not easy, even or perhaps particularly when you're a good deal better than most of your male counterparts. And I suspect the same applies in other sports, in, including rugby, yet having watched the spectacular rise in popularity and success of the Orkney Dragons, I'm pretty confident that this is a group of women that can meet most of those challenges in their stride. Capturing the BT Women's North League uh, 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 last season, so soon after uh, first starting to compete, their success is inspiring more girls and women to get involved, a pattern I understand has been seen in other parts of the country too. And the great thing about rugby, as former Dragons captain Joe Inkster observed, is that rugby is a place for everyone. Whether in the men's or the women's game, rugby helpfully accommodates those of all shapes, all sizes and all abilities. On the downside, however, availability of training facilities, including floodlit uh, 4G pitches, can be a challenge. So too female-friendly changing rooms, without which I understand some younger players can be reluctant to sign up. Getting enough competitive games throughout the season is also an issue, though not just for the Dragons, this applies to age group teams, both male and female, across the Highlands and Islands. And then, of course, there's the question of costs. Whether like Sarah McPhail, you're travelling regularly to take part in development pathways, or you're one of many uh, individuals or teams heading to the Scottish mainland to compete, travel costs for island athletes are high and can be prohibitive. Welcome steps have been taken to provide grants and specific, to specific athletes across a range of sports, and sponsorship from local businesses and travel providers is utterly invaluable. Without it and the time put in by parents, coaches and volunteers, of course, sport in our island communities would be a pale shadow of what it is. That said, despite the obvious talent there is, it can often be the case that only those going away to university or college get spotted and selected. Orkney's Beth Thompson, who's broken into Scotland's under-21 rugby setup, is perhaps a case in point, getting a break only after she started at Edinburgh Uni. Beth's former captain uh, at Orkney Dragons, Joe Inkster, is also firmly of the view, channeling her inner Brian Whittle, that more rugby, indeed more sport, needs to be part of the curriculum. She says playing sport should be the norm every, every day, like going to English or maths classes. Jo had the, uh, added that keeping girls involved in sport through their teenage years is vitally important. Interestingly, Anna Tate made the observation to me that, unsurprisingly, many young girls are affected by image in sport. Many, she says, are worried about appearance when taking part, particularly where the culture or perception of sport is seen about being muscly, sweaty, and by extension, ugly. Anna also made a specific plea to raise greater awareness of the importance of sports bras. As she says, it's a huge barrier to many girls and women when exercising and taking part in sport. I believe girls should be educated about this at school as it may increase participation and make girls more comfortable and able to enjoy sport. A small ask, but one with the potential to make a big difference perhaps. President Officer, I welcome today's debate. I, I thank the Minister for the way in which he set the tone and Anna Sarwa and Brian Whittle for, uh, I think, commendable and very worthwhile uh, amendments. And we will be supporting both of those at decision time this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. We move to the opening part of the debate and I call Jenny Gilruth to be followed by Finlay Carson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I start by taking the opportunity to welcome the Minister to his new role. His constituency of Dundee City West is synonymous for me with sports and indeed any fifer of my vintage will recall the former Olympia swimming pool which once stood uh, close to the site of the new b &A. a more stark contrast in architecture you would be hard pushed to find. Olympia's flumes, including the terrifying yellow cannonball, glowed brightly as you crossed the River Tay from the Kingdom. This week is a time to celebrate women's and girls' involvement in sport, so what do we know? 98% of schools in Scotland provide at least two hours of our periods of PE per week, up 10% from 2004-05. The Daily Mile has children from primary out and about for 15 minutes a day. And Scotland women's football team are off to the World Cup. All very welcome news. But to celebrate properly, we must reflect upon the inequalities which still characterise Scottish sports, from the classroom to the football pitch. According to SQA data this year, 10,302 boys in Scotland were presented at National 5 level in physical education. This compares to just 5,095 girls, less than half the numbers of boys. But of that cohort, 53.1% of the girls secured A passes compared to 41.9% of their male counterparts. 
Presiding officer, girls simply aren't choosing PE in our schools and we need to reflect on why that is and why, if they do go against the grain, they outperform their male counterparts who will replace the next Scotland's women's football team in the future generations to come. In 1998, a case study by a former colleague of mine found that if girls wanted to succeed at PE at standard grade level, then they needed to act like boys. Boys were much more likely to be selected to demonstrate in class. She argued some 20 years ago now that physical education had created a generation of lost girls. We must now look at what the data is telling us. What are the reasons today in 2018, which mean that less than half of the amount of girls in S4 choose PE over their male counterparts? On this note, I was delighted to note the announcement yesterday from the government to commit £300,000 to projects to help get more women and girls into sport. And I previously raised uh, linking the health and education portfolios to tackle the attainment gap. So perhaps there's an opportunity here to link sport with promoting academic attainment more broadly, as Brian Whittle alluded to in his contribution today. Presiding officer, as a former member of the Parliament's Health and Sport Committee, we published the report Sport for Everyone in November 2017. And as Aberté University told us, children who have had a poor experience in school are less likely to stick with sport and exercise as they go into adulthood. Much like closing the poverty-related attainment gap, therefore, early intervention is key to ensure that children develop a positive affiliation with sport. Indeed, there are proven links between academic attainment and sport with a 2014 Public Health England report on uh, linking between pupil health and well-being and attainment, finding a positive association exists between academic attainment and physical activity levels in pupils. On that, I was glad to see specific mention uh, in the Greens Amendment today, although I've not, I know it's not been taken, of the socio-economic disadvantage um, which also exists. We must acknowledge that access to sport from the youngest age is obviously predicated on social stratification. The poorer you are, the less likely you are to have access to sport from the outset. That, for me, is why physical education in school holds the key to closing the socio-economic gap in opportunity. Because if mum or dad or someone isn't running about to football, hockey, swimming, dancing, what chance have you otherwise to succeed in sport? What chance have you even just to try it? School is the leveller, and I firmly believe that there should be more done to invest in our PE departments nationally. I am grateful to the Scottish Sports Association ahead of today's debate for the following information uh, on women when it comes to sport. We note that it leads to a 20 to 40 percent reduced risk of breast cancer, increased confidence with young women in the UK having some of the lowest levels of confidence in Europe, a pay gap difference potentially of up to 8 percent higher earnings. Presiding officer, reducing cancer rates, improving well-being, closing the gender-related pay gap, all policies this government seeks to advance. Perhaps sport could be the answer to all three. It is also welcome news, therefore, that the SSA will receive an extra £70,000 of government funding for 2018-19 to increase the representation of women and minority ethnic communities in sport. I very much hope that some of this funding will be used to work directly with our secondary schools to make a difference where it counts. For example, widening access to the school estate, which was highlighted as an opportunity in the recent Health Committee report previously mentioned. Presiding officer, I remember the last time that Scotland's men's team qualified for the World Cup. The year was 1998. Delamitri was singing Don't Come Home Too Soon, and I'd managed to buy myself a reduced price umbro strip from the Wellgate in Dundee. It was a good time to be a Scotland supporter, briefly. In 2018, that hope still exists, encompassed in the ethos of Scotland's women's team. And I am so proud that this SNP government has committed to fund our national squad, allowing those who aren't professionals to train full time from January. But perhaps we can also be proud of Vivian McLaren, the chair of Scotland's women's football, who explained to this week's Scotland on Sunday why the team rejects bids for sponsorship from alcohol or gambling companies. She said, we don't want to take money where there's girls playing football out there who can't afford to get to training. We're trying to help clubs support their players. There's kids that can't afford football boots, and yet there's alcohol and gambling brands around a lot of sports. She's right. Vivian's attitude is inspirational, and yet there are so many other Scottish women like her involved in sport. Liz McColgan, Eve Muirhead, Lindsay Sharp, all role models of their own time who deserve to be celebrated. But, presiding officer, Scotland needs more female sporting role models, and to get them, we need to find out why so few continue to pick PE in school. It is an aptitude, as the exam results tell us, to challenge gender segregation in sport, we need to go back to the classroom to ensure sport for all. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Finlay Carson to be followed by Sandra White. Thank you, presiding officer and fellow athlete. 
as uh, someone who's been a lifelong sports fan, I, and, and I must declare an interest of a father having a daughter I regard as my sporting star, I'm delighted to be taking part in this debate. I was pleased to see the Scottish Government hold the first ever Women and Girl in Sports Week 12 months ago, and here we are again <coughs> celebrating across the country. Back then, we saw the creation of a Women and Girls Advisory Board aimed at encouraging more women to sport. Absolutely a step in the right direction. But one year on, as we take part in today's debate, there remains a lot of hard work to do to ensure there is equity and equality of provision, not just in regards to addressing the disparity between boys and girls, or with regards to the, the link between deprivation and low participation, but also between rural and urban areas. Many barriers remain, and these are particularly prevalent in rural Galloway and Western Fries, where our budding female athletes often find their opportunities limited and or face barriers in terms of transport uh, costs and access to suitable facilities. Galloway athlete, athletes like Joe Muir, an international model, modern pentathlete, or Kirsty Yates competing in the short putt, have had amazing success despite the barriers that rurality brings. And these barriers are still there for our young athletes in our region. Joe, Kirsty, and my own daughter's sporting careers required them to travel, in some instances, more than uh, three times a week from Galloway to Glasgow or Edinburgh or Sheffield for coaching and to travel hundreds of miles to take part in various competition. Today's motion from the government refers to the positive work being done by active schools and what they're doing in terms of increasing the participation of girls. But this is not the case when you look at what's happened in Dumfries and Galloway. Only this year, the, the Labour SNP administration saw fit to restructure and cut its active school budget reducing it by 81,000, which in turn affects the match funding from Sports Scotland. Sadly, that trend is set to continue in the coming years with potentially another 120,000 set to be cut uh, over the next two years on current projections. I would hardly say that that was a positive message being sent out when we want to increase participation. Only last week, a teacher contacted me bemoaning the lack of sports in school. His school, uh, inter-schools games such as netball and basketball have been cancelled down to transport costs. This is wholly detrimental to sporting development at a vital age in school when our youngsters are perhaps deciding whether to pursue a sporting career or not, or simply to decide to keep active. With rural communities already suffering for social isolation, I believe today offers a perfect opportunity to raise those concerns in order to make the government aware of the, of the reality in many rural schools. Hey, can I thank Finley Carson for taking the intervention. I wonder if you could explain how he thinks cutting taxes would help the situation in terms of support for sport in our, uh, sport in our schools and communities. Finley Carson. Uh, yeah, I think uh, you, you know fine our position is that the, the, the important thing to do is to grow the economy, but that again is for another day. With rural communities already suffering from social isolation, I believe today offers a perfect opportunity to raise the concerns. As I started, uh, and I mentioned my daughter, Vicky, um, she is somebody who has succeeded, uh, even though the, the, the barriers were put in front of her, she still carried on to pursue her dreams of reaching the top in ice hockey. Despite 6 a.m. starts and 1 a.m. finishes, and often having to drive three 60 mile trips a week, to play for the Solway Sharks. And uh, uh, Dumfries was actually close for us, uh, only having to travel that distance. Others had to travel as far afield as Aberdeen. Now, she recently played in the Czech Republic, and I couldn't be more proud of her because she's got there despite the rurality being a major barrier. But her family were there to support her. Many families who have sons or daughters with equal ability have not been in that position. In some cases, it cost it 60 pounds a week just to play ice hockey. As touched on earlier, there are other local success stories in Dumfries and Galloway when it comes to female sports stars. There's too many to mention, but pentathlete Joe Muir from the Hockevar has enjoyed success at the European Championships and in the World Cup in her discipline, progressing from being a junior world champion in 2013 to only a few weeks ago overcoming the altitude to claim a top 20 finish in the World Modern Pentathlon Championships in Mexico City. Joe achieved this despite an initial lack of funding and sporting opportunities in Galloway. She's a terrific role model and we're all very proud of her. But it's not just athletics. Vicky Adams, a curler for Port Patrick, uh, was part of the squad that won bronze at the World Olympics. 
and has had gold medal success at the 2013 World Championships and the European Championships in 2011 and 2014. And I was reminded that we've also got a fantastic uh, women's rugby team in the Stuarty Sirens. When it comes to barriers to encouraging girls into sport in my constituency, the lack of role models certainly isn't a barrier because we have them in abundance. But, presiding officer, when it comes to rural communities, it's about having the facilities and the training opportunities in place that will allow our girls who wish to participate in sport to hone their skills. Progress continues to be slow and there remains a real concern that the money, both centrally and locally, is not being filtered through into rural communities who need it most. We saw the commitment to increase women's participation in sport in the SNP's programme for government in 2017-18, which is very welcome. But as we celebrate this week, we must see a renewed focus on how to best to achieve that and ensure all areas of Scotland benefit. Sport Scotland's corporate plan lays out equalities and inclusion as one of their three priorities for improvement and recognises the exclusion that can be experienced in some parts of Scotland. One of the three priorities is a commitment to ensure our young people from our most deprived areas, as well as girls and young women, will have access to greater sporting opportunities. This must also have a focus on rural Scotland, where there is a great need for parity, given facilities are simply not on the doorstep, unlike many urban areas. Quite simply, we need literally and metaphorically the promise of a level playing field. Presiding officer, sport can be a fantastic tool for bringing people together, and I know my daughter Vicky has forged some wonderful friendships through her ice hockey participation. The benefits can't be under, understated, and that's why I'm regularly contacted by constituents who want to see not only a greater development of sporting facilities, but better and clearer skills development pathways, and these have got to be delivered where they're needed most. We need local authorities like Dumfries and Galloway to be in a position to lead by example, and only then will we see not only further female champions emerge, but happier and healthier constituents in my constituency and indeed across Scotland. Thank you very much. And I call Sandra White to be followed by Claire Baker. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. It may seem difficult to imagine, but I played hockey, I played netball, I actually ran in uh, relay teams. I, I was very, very sporty when, when I was younger, uh, basically. And I think one of the reasons for that was the fact that my school was quite close to where I stayed. And I think perhaps at that time, most schools were as well. I would walk to school. The schools were open at night time. The schools were open at the weekends that we could go along and play netball and hockey on, on the, the sports fields of the schools. So I think it's something that's not just uh, to encourage you know, women and girls. It's also dips into a health portfolio and an education portfolio as well. And if we can pick up on some of the other issues that was raised, Anna Sarwar did raise it and Alison Johnson and others as well, in regards to the, big, the huge big gap when I was on the Equal Opportunities Committee, we did an inquiry into why. And all of the things that you raised actually did come up at that time as well. But there were other issues too, like social pressure from your peers, that came up, and a cultural issue as well. So I think it's important we do look at that and we, we make sure <clears throat> that we address that too. So it's not just one portfolio, it goes through all of the portfolios of the Parliament as well. Now, like others, I really am pleased that uh, uh, government funding has been in, and it's already been mentioned by Jenny Gilruth, £300,000 of uh, government funding. I think that's to be welcome to encourage uh, women and girls to go further ahead and, and join in the sports as well. And I really would encourage any authorities, I know that the uh, applications are open for the Scottish gov governing bodies of sport and local authorities as part of a programme to get monies and encourage more women and girls. And I would encourage them to actually apply to that as, as soon as possible. Uh, I want to go into some more recent things now. I really do want to congratulate, as others have already mentioned, the Scotland's Women's Squad uh, on their great success. Absolutely amazing and they're great. But we shouldn't be surprised because we all know that women uh, excel much more than men in lots of things. It's just encouraged them to get forward in the sporting aspects of it. Yes, well. Keith Brown. Can I thank Sandra Wright for taking intervention and do, would she wish to join with me in congratulating Hibs ladies who've contributed substantially to the success of uh, Scottish uh, women's football but also today she was talking about recent success and Jenny Gilrue said who's going to follow on the under 17s for Scotland today won their first uh, match in the European uh, qualifying championship by 2-1 against Lithuania so we can congratulate them as well. 
I think you've already done it for her, <laughs> Ms White. There's no harm in doing it again, presiding officer. I absolutely do uh, congratulate them. And what I was going to say was they're all great role models for, for, for women and young girls. And uh, may they go on in the future as well. We're in safe hands in that respect. And, and I want to mention someone that's uh, in the constituency. And in fact, Leanne Crichton from, from Glasgow has had a successful, a very successful footballing career playing at both club level for local, local Glasgow City FC and for the national squad as well. Part of the women's under 19 squad that qualified for the UEFA European Championships in Hungary in 2005. Midfielder won two senior caps before being recalled to the squad after four years for a double, double header against the USA and Nashville in the February 2013. And she scored her first senior goal in a 3-2 friendly win over Iceland uh, in June 2013. And uh, I'm really pleased, and I think Jenny Ruth had mentioned this as well, uh, that the First Minister has given a huge boost, I think, uh, to Scotland's women national team with additional funding, uh, which will enable the whole squad to train full time for the FIFA World Cup. Uh, and I think that says something to our commitment, but as I say, there's lots of other things to go forward as well. I want to raise two other, or highlight two other initiatives in my constituency. Uh, cycling might not be for everyone, but these two initiatives are about not just cycling, but obviously giving people confidence as well. And the first one is Bike for Good, and it's a Glasgow branch. They've teamed up with the Simon Community Scotland to specifically work with women and girls. Now, many of these women and girls have faced real challenges in their lives. Now, the project provides women with the opportunity to learn bike maintenance. Uh, they build a bike as well from scratch. And at the end of the course, each person gets to keep the bike, ensuring they have a cheap and reliable mode of transport and the skills to maintain the bike as well, obviously improving their health as well and giving them confidence uh, 24 women so far have built their own bikes <clears throat> and all have said have a really positive effect on their mental and physical well-being. And if I could just give a quote from, from a couple of them. First one says, I was so nervous before and thought it would be too unfit to get on the bike, but I've been out of it every single day and I finished building it. I was so nervous before I thought I would be there as well, but basically the camaraderie of the other women on the course made it so much worthwhile. I've learned new skills I didn't know I had. I thought I'd be too old and too unfit to learn to get cycling, but there you are, I'm not. The second one is uh, Bells on Bikes. Bells on Bikes, a cycling group for women living in and around Glasgow, offers a mix of rides to cater for all ages and abilities. The group supported by CTC Bike Club, funded by Cycling Scotland, and they've uh, delivered in partnership with Youth Scotland and the Glasgow Bike Station as well. And over the years, Bells and Bikes have trained female cycle trainers to organise, lead and inspire women of all ages to get out on their bikes. Whether you want to start community biking, as I mentioned before, cycle with family and friends at the weekend, or just meet like-minded people, Bells and Bikes is the one thing which actually introduces it to, to you, and it's a great community. In closing, presiding officer, I think one of the best things we can do for our own health is it physically active. Uh, and I've highlighted two initiatives in my constituency, and I'm sure there's others in other constituencies. I hope by debating this today, we'll encourage more women and girls to get active and be fitter as well. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you very much. I call Claire Baker to be followed by George Adam. Mr. Ba Ms. Baker, please. Um, thank you, presiding officer. I welcome today's debate focusing on women and girls in sport. We've already heard about women and girls who are achieving fantastic results in elite sports. We should recognise the commitment, the hard work, the talent and the dedication they have given to their chosen sport and celebrate their achievements. Labour's amendment congratulates the Scottish women's football team and recognises the Scottish Government's support, announcement of financial support. Women participating at a high level still are often still having to earn a living and aren't able to dedicate themselves to their sport and I welcome the funding which will enable the team to concentrate on the tournament. So recognition and sponsorship can be difficult for women to receive and we can see gender disparity across elite sports where women are still receiving less financial reward and lower profiles. And while we have global women sports stars, they are often at the forefront of fighting for greater recognition, respect and parity in their sports. We should consider ways to see a sustainable funding base for all women's competitive sport. I would like to focus on other aspects of the debate. The Scottish Health Survey published last week confirmed some attitudes and behaviours around gender and sport. 
As the Minister has recognised, male, male participation in recreational sport is higher on average than women's. Women are less likely to meet the guidelines for moderate or vigorous physical activity than men, with the greatest gap being in the young adult age group. And the most dramatic statistic is probably that participation in sport among high school age girls declines by 24% compared to 1% for boys. These figures are compounded by deprivation with higher levels of non-participation in areas of high deprivation. And while we rightly celebrate high level achievement, a recent BBC documentary claimed that almost nine in 10 of elite athletes come from a more privileged background. Sports should be the great equaliser, but these figures suggest that for too many people, opportunities are limited and personal as well as national potential isn't being realised. So I welcome the work that's been undertaken to consider the barriers to women and girls' participation in sport. The modest but welcome investment in the Sporting Equity Fund has provided an impetus to work in this area. I know that in Fife, um, that Fighting Chance Scotland received funding for a school judo programme, as well as Fife Council receiving an award to support an active girl to take up cycling. I understand that fund was only for a year and um, the Minister has today confirmed that there will be uh, additional funding available to support um, at grassroots sports. Can I ask if this will be available to the groups who are already in receipt of funding or will it only be for new applications? Um, I also welcome the work of the Women and Girls in Sports Board. They're focused on four key areas to look to increase engagement and should lead them to also con consider how deprivation depresses opportunity. The benefits of an active lifestyle are evident for everyone, not just in physical benefits, but also mental well-being. A lot of good work is going on to challenge the way we think about sport and women and girls' participation. And some members have spoken about the importance of role models and leadership opportunities. I am interested in where this intersects with celebrity culture and the images of perfection that girls are often presented with. The This Girl Can campaign has been about promoting diversity, promoting confidence, taking on myths about femininity and how that is expressed. And Girl Guiding have often been doing a lot of research on this, highlighting that girls can be reluctant to take part in sport because it's regarded as not feminine. And part of this is about activity, about not labelling activity as sporty or otherwise. Sporty, for some, can be a label that enforces a binary approach. You're either good at it and that you win things, or you're not, and so you start to avoid it. At primary school, it is perhaps easier to be more inclusive. And as head teacher at St Ninian's Primary School in Stirling in my region, Elaine Wiley introduced the Daily Mile, a great initiative that embeds positive behaviour and attitude to activity, introducing concepts of keeping active, of socialising, of building it into your daily routine, all easy lessons that will hopefully stay with children throughout their life. So the significant reduction in participation occurs at high school. There is still a gender gap at a younger age, but it becomes more pronounced at high school. The Health and Support Committee's uh, report, Sport for Everyone, last year, found that a negative experience of sport at that age can practically put girls off for life. There are complicated factors for this. Um, being more self-conscious about body image can be a factor, and some of the school changing facilities don't lend themselves to privacy. The range of sport on offer for girls doesn't suit everyone, and the lack of choice is a factor in people not participating. And girls and boys taking part in sports together can can sometimes encourage um, judgments and on ability and also lead to a lack of confidence among girls. The competitive nature of school sports doesn't suit everyone. Now, some of these factors apply equally to boys, but we don't see the same drop off in activity. But having said that, school activity is really important for closing the participation gap. And while I am aware that sports clubs endeavour to keep their fees minimal, for families on rural income, this can be a challenge. The Active Schools Network, working with Sports Scotland, is an important vehicle for bridging the gap between club activity and schools and should be supported to provide more free and affordable sports in school. Finally, a related issue is the financial pressures facing our schools. In Fife, I am aware of reports of teacher post reductions and I've had concerns over the continuing viability of some girls' sports teams representing their school and taking part in competitions because of a lack of teachers who can do the coaching. This must be avoided, and if it is budget cuts that are creating this situation, the cuts need to be reversed. Because while this may look like an easy cut, what is not impacting on core teaching, it is letting down a generation of girls who have shown a commitment to their support, to their sport, and deserve our support. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call George Adam to be followed by Angus Macdonald. Mr. Adam, please. Thank you, President Officer. 
Sport is an important part of life for the majority of Scots, and we can't get enough of it. But on the whole, we tend to be more spectators than participants. But for the sake of our nation's health, we need to do better. We need to change things. We need to be more involved. I cannot remember, presiding officer, the last time I played uh, five-a-side football. Well, t the truth is I can remember, but I'm slightly embarrassed for the young man that was fitter and faster that I halved in two as he tried to, he ran past me at one point as well. But when I played football other times with people of a certain age and a certain speed and ability and fitness, I seem to enjoy it slightly more as well. And I think it's all about uh, making sure that you enjoy sport within your own uh, group of, uh, kind of peers as well. And they also say that men's attitudes change when they have a daughter. And, presiding officer, that's true, but it's equally the same when you have a granddaughter. You want them to achieve and be part of absolutely everything. And it's equally important for women and girls to see sport as something that they should be involved in. Sometimes we can be too hard on ourselves, as Scotland has a proud tradition in female sport and physical activity, not least the recent success of our national football team making the World Cup finals. Our women footballers are, show, have show, are showing the men that Scotland can still qualify for a major tr tournament. This qualification has, ex uh, uh, qualification has excited us all, even more so in Paisley, as St Murn Park has been the home venue for many of Scotland's national women's team's games. So much so that my wife Stacey has stated that she wants to go to France next year to follow the Tartan Army girls. But, presiding officer, she'll be going herself, because unless you change the sittings of Parliament next year, I'll be at my work. But football, as our national port, should be leading the way in this, because there, so there is much development happening in Paisley with the women's game. This summer, St Murn FC launched their own women's team. And as is the norm with a club like St Murn, funding will always be an issue. But it was agreed with a group of female footballers that Paisley would have its first major football side. Scott, St Murn Independent Supporters Association, of which I am the convener and also owns 28% of the club, sponsored their strips and the women involved raised funding themselves for league entry and their ongoing expenses. This shows that there is no such as, thing as an impossible task. Difficult and challenging it may be, but they managed to kick off at the start of the season. Yes. Mr Whittle. Thank you, uh, George Allen, for taking the intervention. The Minister and I heard uh, a story the other night from a, a young uh, female footballer who wasn't allowed to play football at school because they thought she would be too fragile. And she's actually managed to continue on. That sort of, that sort of attitude is something we have to tackle. Mr. Whittle was Mr. Correct. Adam. Mr. Whittle was correct because that is some of the attitudes that we have to deal with and make sure that we get access for all, uh, everyone to have access to sports as we move on. But, you know, this isn't the only thing that's happening with the women's game, with the St Mun uh, women's football team. There's been an increase in teams from what was traditionally called our boys club, although that's not the case now. They're all called youth football clubs. Glenifer Thistle, a team that brought his players like St Mun legend and now sports pundit Stephen Thompson, has a girls section and a women's team. St Mun Youth FC, not connected with the professional club, has a girls section, as does St Peter's FC. And if I move away from the centre of the known universe to far away Linwood, we can see that Linwood Rangers, former, captain, uh, former Scotland captain Paul Lambert's first team, they have a girls section too. But you may have noticed, presiding officer, all the names I've mentioned of famous uh, former professional players have all played for St Mern, but they're also all male. They're all male. We need to, and we must ensure that young women and girls have their own sporting heroes to look up to and inspire to be like. There needs to be some form of parity between the women's game and the men's game. This will not be easy, and it will be require funding and a change of attitude in our national sport by the SFA, SPFL, and at club level, and as Mr Whittle explained there, at other levels within uh, the game as well. But supporters also need to look towards women's football in a more positive manner, and that might be the bigger uh, issue for us all. Scotland's women's qualified for the World Cup finals. Their male counterparts haven't been there, as Jenny Gilruth said, since 1998. Ironically, again, in France, we need to ensure that these sportswomen have the heroes to, they are the heroes to young women today, and they continue their success. That's why I welcome the fact that the Scotland's uh, national team squad will be able to train full time for the FIFA 2019 World Cup with additional funding from the Scottish Government. They'll be full time from January 2019 ahead of the tournament in France and this will strengthen the women and girls game in Scotland. 
St Martin uh, Football Club chairman and majority shareholder Gordon Scott has already announced that the club are going to go beyond just having their own women's football team. He wants to create St Martin Women's and Girls Football Academy. Our team in Paisley already knows the success that this has brought our men's team having an academy and see the opportunity that our club has to develop this further. The St Martin Academy has produced Scotland internationals like John McGinn, Kenny McLean and Lewis Morgan. The supporters see the value of this in financial terms and on the field, but Gordon's plan is to have this in Fergusley Park in Paisley and using St Mern Community Trust as a way to take it forward with Gail Brannigan leading the way. Gail is well known within Renfrewshire for running sports trusts and sporting community programmes and we have an opportunity to use this idea and this project to actually use it as a pilot to see that we can do something like that. Because we can say to young women in places like Fergusley Park, it does not matter where you live, it does not matter where you come from, but you can be part of our national game and our national sport and play for the famous Paisley St. Mum. You know, but one thing, uh, all the challenges we'll have in that project will be actually funding. It will be the usual situations that we have. And I would ask the Sports Minister if he'd like to come to St Martin Park and actually discuss this with uh, Gordon uh, Scott and Gail Brannigan. Presiding Officer, St Martin used a tagline say, uh, saying, our town, our team. Now we're looking at taking this even further and ensuring that St Martin are Paisley's team to the whole community. For me, I look forward to the day when I sit with my granddaughter, my, da uh, my daughter and my wife, and I see St Mern lift the Women's Scottish Cup. And only then, when that date goes down in these famous dates from St Mern in the past, will I say that we've definitely got the equality in Paisley. Uh, thank you. I don't know if anybody noticed the name St Mirren in that speech, but some of you no doubt has been counting the references. I call Angus MacDonald to be followed by Alison Harris, please. Okay, thanks, uh, President Officer. It's a pleasure to be speaking in this debate, albeit uh, a little unexpected, as uh, Stuart McMillan had been hoping to uh, speak in this place. However, he's been called away to his constituency. So, um, first and foremost, uh, I'd like to join colleagues in the Chamber by adding my congratulations to our women's national football team on reaching the World Cup. It's something that hasn't happened for Scotland since France 98, and I'm looking forward to France 2019, where everyone will be rooting for them in the tournament next June, if not uh, attending uh, the actual event. Um, it is true to say that uh, taking part in physical activity or sport is one of the best ways to maintain our physical and mental health, and it's definitely on my to-do list, uh, and clearly long overdue. Um, although I'll maybe just uh, start with the, the chair yoga that I was ex experiencing uh, at the event that I held uh, in Parliament on Tuesday evening. That may, that may well be exertion enough uh, to start with. Um, but uh, not only the benefits to physical and mental health uh, are, are clearly uh, the case, but also uh, taking part in sports can also be an incredibly social activity which builds confidence and relationships and friendships so it can be fun at the same time. But that isn't to say that there aren't still barriers stopping women and girls taking part in sport, and that's something we must address. If we look at examples in elite sport, eh, such as our women's national football team uh, or our incredibly successful women's cycling and swimming teams, it's clear to see the inspiration they have on women and girls in encouraging involvement and sport and getting active. Elite sports absolutely have a role to play in that encouragement, however, it's ensuring, uh, it is ensuring that re that resource and accessibility is available at the grassroots level where we'll see the majority of the barriers broken down and more women and girls enco encouraged to take part. Now, the Scottish Government and Sports Scotland have, for example, through the Active Schools and Active Girls programme, seen an increase of children doing two hours or periods of PE per week from less than 10% in 2004-05 to 98% in 2016, uh, which of course was a, an SNP manifesto commitment. And we've seen that not, that not only does, uh, we've seen that not only does PE have a positive impact on physical health, but it has a positive impact on educational attainment and life chances too, uh, as Minister Marie Todd mentioned in her intervention to, to Brian Whittle. So when we look at uh, one of the simplest forms of exercise, which is, is walking, uh, the rollout of the Daily Mile in schools across Scotland has significantly increased the health and well-being of pupils, but it also has a positive effect on learning in the classroom. Uh, Presiding officer, as part of that commitment, the Scottish Government provided £11.6 million 
£50,000 of investment between 2012 and 2016. However, this has been backed up by £50 million to be invested in active schools from between 2015 and 2019 through Sports Scotland, which is clearly welcome. Their vision of a Scotland where sport is a way of life, where sport is at the heart of Scottish society and has a positive impact on people and communities is certainly something that we all want to see achieved. And I believe we're on the path to achieving this. However, we must ensure that all issues, especially those facing women and girls, are taken into account, no matter the background or stage in life. This is something the Women and Girls in Sport Board are passionate about, and it involves recognition that there are different challenges facing women and girls in relation to maintaining healthy levels of physical activity at different stages in their lives. And of course, the four areas identified for focus are intervention, uh, what is needed to get more women and girls physically active and into sports, prevention, what measures will ensure women and girls don't drop out of physical activity or sport and have opportunities to continue, reconnection, how women and girls can get back into physical activity or sport when a major change to their life happens, and continuation, helping women and girls continue with physical activity or sport throughout their lives. Through campaigns such as the hashtag She Can, She Will, which was launched ahead of Scottish Women and Girls in Sport Week, eh, the discussion focuses on women and girls in sport. And through further discussion and understanding, we'll continue to make progress in breaking down the barriers faced. It is clear, however, to see that progress has been made over the years in getting more women and girls into sport. We've, we have, for example, seen significant increases in women and girls in Scotland participating in sports and physical activity, including walking and biking, as well as traditional sports such as netball, hockey and shinty. But through funding projects such as Fit for Girls and ensuring that there are grassroots clubs available in communities across Scotland, there are 192 community sports hubs uh, across Scotland, including the Trist Community Sports Hub in Larbert. Uh, we also have to look at the increase in participation through active schools in the likes of karate and dodgeball, which has quadrupled in the years between 2011-12 and 2016-17, and sports such as tennis, football, cross-country and gymnastics, which have doubled in uh, participation. These sports have the biggest increase in sessions participated in by girls, which shows that although much more can still be done, we're certainly doing something right. In closing, President Officer, more can and clearly will be done to increase participation of women and girls in sport and physical activity, and certainly more will be done to understand and break more of the barriers down that stop them from doing so. However, when we look to the progress made over the past few years, Scotland is on the right path, and we should continue to push those boundaries and make sure that we continue on that path. We're achieving success on the global stage at Commonwealth, Olympic, World and European Championship medals to be proud of, and of course success to come in the future but we should continue to make these inroads and increase participation so that scotland's women and girls have every opportunity to become involved and stay involved no matter their background or the stage they are at in life and that will lead to a healthier and better scotland for everyone thank you thank you i call alison harris to fall by gillian martin and miss martin will be the last speaker in the open debate miss harris please deputy presiding officer I'm delighted to speak in this debate marking Women and Girls in Sport Week. A recent study by the University of Bristol highlighted that by the age of nine, less than one third of girls met the suggested level of support and fitness activity compared to two thirds of boys. The gap closes in adulthood, but there is still a strong bias in favour of men. The reasons why females are less involved in sport are varied, but many have been mentioned by previous speakers. But I'm pleased that this week gives an opportunity to turn the spotlight on the gender gap in sporting activity that exists and amongst young people in particular. You know, when I think back to my own days and my introduction to sport, or what in those days was referred to as PE or gym, you, know, you will not be surprised to hear that I wasn't really a budding athlete. At school, my cousin was the games captain in sixth year. And when I arrived in my first year at the school, I remember vividly the excitement of the PE teachers who were desperate to meet the potential new games captain, whom they assumed would follow in the family footsteps. I can say without one shadow of doubt that I did not like hockey. I did not like jumping into a sand pit. I did not like jumping over hurdles, which I regarded as positively dangerous. In fact, I did not even like jumping over a horse 
but had no head or tail. As I'm sure you've worked out by now, I didn't rise to the dizzy heights of games captain, but merely the dizzy heights of being in charge of cutting the oranges for the half time during hockey. But that disastrous introduction to sport actually had a more serious repercussion, and that was that I wasn't introduced in my early school years to the importance and fun of physical activity. Thankfully, since those days, there has been a huge expansion in the variety of sports and activities available in schools. Many secondary schools now have swimming pools, jogging has become commonplace, and there's a huge growth in keep fit classes being provided along with traditional sports of hockey, netball, track and field. And I'm delighted now that as part of the higher curriculum, a higher dance course is now on offer. Now that actually is a course that I would have enjoyed. The importance of this physical activity and indeed the introduction to physical activity does without a shadow of a doubt improve mental health and well-being and being physically fit does lead to improved self-esteem as we've heard earlier today. I think it is important for this to be introduced at primary school level and it's a common fact that children don't get to run around now as much as they would have years ago. Bringing sport into primary schools at an early age is ultimately an introduction to keeping fit and sets up a chain of positive reactions which these children will take through life. By encouraging more women into sport and physical activity, raising awareness of those who do regularly take part and addressing the barriers that cause the differing uptakes between males and females, I hope that this week builds on the success of last year's inaugural event. Many young people see gym membership as a must have, and more and more women and girls are now involved in sports such as football, rugby, and martial arts. So yes, things have improved, yet it is clear that work still has to be done to close the gap in physical activity. We all know the importance of role models, and thanks to the success of the Commonwealth and Olympic Games, we have enjoyed seeing many sportswomen, such as the young boxer Nicola Adams, become a household name. Deputy Presiding Officer, we have heard the saying that success brings success, and I'm sure that is very much the case with sport. Hopefully the successes of our sportswomen have, ha have had will boost the amount of coverage that female sports in television and in the media from the current derisory 7%, as I think Alison Johnson previously mentioned. You know, why should media interest be so low? A survey carried out for Insured for Sport had some interesting findings. When asked which sports they watched, and despite its growing profile, 44% said that they would watch men's football, but only 17% women's. Rugby still showed a heavy male bias, while tennis, athletics and swimming showed much less disparity of people's preference for watching. Of the 22 sports included in the survey, there were only two in which the female version were more likely to be watched, volleyball and hockey. Clearly, and despite much progress, there still remains a perception that there are sports for men and sports for women. And this is a factor in discouraging some women for partic from participating in certain sports. Some studies suggest that competitive sports are not so attractive to women as they are to men, but few will disagree that in politics and business, women have shown that they are every bit as competitive as men. Although it has to be said that sport doesn't always have to be a competition, it can be just an activity that you actually enjoy doing. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, participation in sport and physical activities is a vital part in maintaining good health and mental well-being. And I'm sure that I will join all colleagues in hoping that the spotlight on improving female participation lasts far longer than just this week. And it's my pleasure to support the motions tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Gillian Martin, who's the last speaker in the open debate. Ms Martin, please. Thank you, President Officer. First of all, I want to welcome the Minister for Public Health, Sport and Wellbeing's announcement yesterday um, about su supporting uh, projects that help women and girls take up sport or physical activity with the uh, £300,000 uh, funding. Because uh, we all know that... Um, be, the, the benefit of these funds encourage more Scots to take up physical activity will mean that getting active has profound health 
uh, benefits physically and mentally and provide money to take away the barriers that prevent women and girls in Scotland from taking up sport or physical activity can only be a positive step tackling some of our challenges that our society faces like obesity, social isolation, loneliness, so low self-esteem and, and sport and exercise as we know is, is hugely beneficial for people with depression um, as, and as someone who enjoys getting on their bike um, I, I was, I'm, I'm very keen, and I've mentioned this in the chamber before, I was very keen to use my bike to reduce my car usage when I was working in Aberdeen. But um, I'm going to be uh, quite blunt, our cycle routes and pathways are just not good enough. They're just not safe enough. And as someone who took that step to try and decrease her car or, you know, her carbon output by, by taking up cycling as my commute, um, I quickly gave it up because it was just too damn dangerous. Um, and, and last night I was hosting, as my, in my position as convener for the, the Committee on Climate Change, we were, we were looking at some of the impacts um, uh, around climate change with some, uh, we had an outreach event where some people came into the Parliament from, from Elgin, Glasgow and, uh, and Fife. And we were talking about some of these barriers, and these barriers to physical activity that people would want to to do, which would also reduce their carbon footprint. And that hasn't been mentioned in this debate, that you know, if you're taking up physical exercise for its own sake, that's fine, but you could also be exercising as a means to actually commuting and traveling as well. But there's so many barriers to people doing that. Um, infrastructure come out number, number one, safety of roads, lack of cycle routes, Cycle routes are just not joined up enough, and I know that from cycling in Edinburgh. There will be a point at which you're on a safe cycle route, and all of a sudden it stops, and you're on a busy roundabout, and your heart's in your mouth. Um, we also mentioned uh, workplaces and schools not having, particularly workplaces, not having facilities for uh, bike storage and uh, sa safe routes to those destinations and changing facilities. Uh, it was mentioned as well by people, many people in that session. And our youngest participant, nine-year-old Quinn Boyd from Leaven, uh, by the way, Jenny Gilruth, you've got competition there, I'll tell you that right now. Um, she said that every child, she came up with this fantastic idea and it really struck me. She said every child should have the right to a bike the right to a bike. She didn't say, let's give everyone free bikes. She said, the right to a bike. And I thought that was a really powerful and a pretty good idea. But I would also add to what Quinn said and say, I think they should also, also have the right to a safe route to school on their bike as well. And I made the point in my intervention to Brian Whittle uh, earlier on in the debate that you don't have to be particularly good at sport to benefit it. And I, I'm right with you, Alison Harris, because I was that soldier. Um, I mean, my family find it really amusing that I'm taking part in a debate about women in sport. Um, and if they are watching, and sometimes they do, my mum will probably be laughing right now. But I'm, I'm one of those clients who used to worry about getting picked last in PE. I hope they don't do that in schools anymore, because I tell you right now, it is, does not build your self-esteem being the last lassie in the, in the queue to, to be picked for the team. Um, and often, that would, if you've got kids that have got low self-esteem, or are shy, or they've got body consciousness, that lack of confidence can manifest itself in not being particularly confident in sport. And sport could actually build that self-confidence, so it's a vicious, a vicious circle. So those form formative years, where you fail to excel in sport, it can put a person off. Um, and even if you exactly, you really enjoyed sport for its own sake, which I did. I loved basketball and volleyball in particular, but it wasn't until I was taken under the wing of a PE teacher um, who saw that enjoyment in me, not particularly ability, but a massive enjoyment. Um, when I was a pupil at the British School in Rio de Janeiro when I was 12, 13, and that I felt that I can flourish in that often exclusionary environment. And remember, if you're a teenager, you're very self-conscious. So if you are made to feel that you're not good at something, you will probably at that point not do it again. Um, so under this, the care of this teacher, I became actually quite good at those, both these sports. Um, so it turns out that enthusiasm can make up for lack of innate natural ability. Um, 
So, so I also I wanted to address Finlay Carson's political points and the priorities of local councils. He's not in the chamber just now because he didn't take my intervention. But what I wanted to say was take care about making those political points because right across the country, you'll have local authorities who are making decisions which are stopping people from accessing sport. My own situation in Aberdeenshire Council, it's a Conservative-led council. They've cut visiting specialists. And I, I find that for rural schools, we have sports specialists who be going to small rural schools that people are missing out and having a, an access to, to, to sport that they wouldn't otherwise have. Um, but in saying that, you know, sports for all, it doesn't matter if you're good at it, I do want to make quick, me quick mention of a couple of uh, sports champions for, for women in my constituency. Hannah Miley, everyone knows Hannah Miley. I could use up the rest of my time actually talking about the achievements that, uh, and, and Christine's going like that, but I don't, I'm not going to list all her achievements. Everyone knows what they are. Um, and she still trains at Inverurie Pool, which I think is, uh, gives uh, young, young people from Inverurie great confidence. And then there's Natalie Ross, who plays midfield for Celtic um, and has got 11 senior Scotland international caps. Um, she's from Ellen and she trained and played for Ellen Meadows. It's the only girl playing for that boys club. Um, and I want to squeeze in a wee mention for John Duffus, who coaches Aberdeen FC ladies and girls, um, who recently got an award for his, uh, his, his, his contribution to, to women in football. Um, I just want to make a, a quick mention. You can't also. make any quick mentions. And can I also say it's very nice to be friendly, but I am the presiding officer when you're addressing me when I'm in the chair. You maybe didn't notice, but others did. I didn't notice, but thank right. you, presiding no, officer. Thank you very much. Sit down. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, now, can I also say, um, <laughs> yes, uh, can, I, can I call on now Mary Fee, please, to close for Labour. Miss Fee, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased to be closing this afternoon's debate for Scottish Labour, marking Scotland's second annual Women in Sport Week, and I'm grateful for the support for our amendment around the Chamber. And this has been a good humoured debate, and we've had a, a range of informative and interesting contributions from across the Chamber, reflecting on how we can work together to make sco sport in Scotland more accessible for women. Um, and we've heard of the numerous health and wellbeing benefits of sport. And Anna Sarwar in his opening remarks rightly highlighted the link between poverty and participation. And the cost of sports kits and entry to sporting facilities can be a significant barrier to participation. And Anna Sarwar also spoke of the importance of tackling obesity and the role sport plays in mental health, health well-being and in, in mood. And Brian Whittle, in his um, opening contribution, made an interesting point about the lack of women coaches. And I have to say, it's, it's not something I had given much thought to in, in preparation um, for this debate. But what better role model than a woman coach? Um, and that was also a point that was made by um, Anas Sarwar. And Alison Johnson spoke of the, the massive difference in media coverage of, of women um, in news and sport, and how can we showcase something if there is little or no coverage of that for, for people um, to, to see? And many contributions spoke of the long-term health benefits of sport, the disparity in participation, and the role that we as parliamentarians can play in promoting and encouraging physical activity. And Liam MacArthur, in, in his opening um, comments, named several of our very successful athletes. And that's something that I will do later on in, in my contribution. And I think, presiding officer, although I may be wrong, but I do think that George Adam may have mentioned Paisley or St Mirren in his contribution. I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Uh, but, but seriously, presiding officer, um, recent research on equality in sport, which was published by Sports Scotland, has illuminated the, the gender disparity in participation. And it revealed that more men regularly participate in sport. And secondly, that the, the, the lower participation by women in sport be begins between the ages of 13 and 15. And that is why active schools is a very important initiative. And it does help to encourage young people to come more active in schools. And Active Schools works with all of our 32 local authorities and it does play a pivotal, a pivotal role in encouraging young women and young girls to become more involved in sport and physical activity. And I would imagine that most of us in this chamber will have 
taken part in, in, in sport in schools with varying degrees of enthusiasm and varying degrees of, of success. And, and Sandra White spoke of her sporting prowess and, and her contribution, and, and I will speak of my sporting prowess and my contribution, presiding officer. Um, I was um, at school, I was a member of the hockey team, I was a member of the volleyball team, I was a regular in the relay team, and I was also pretty good at the hurdles. Um, but I have to say, presiding officer, my only claim to physical activity now is that I walk a lot. I walk very quickly, um, but that is the limit to my physical activity now. And again, I'm pretty sure that that is probably going to be reflective across this chamber. Our participation in sport either diminishes or stops when we leave school. And it is clear that more must be done to encourage um, and engage young women in sporting activity. Research shows that only 33% of members of playing hubs are women. And this underrepresentation of women in sport is reflective of the underrepresentation of women in the public sphere throughout society. And this year may mark the centenary of the suffragettes who fought for women's equality at the ballot box. But the fight for equality endures and women are still fighting for their rights in Parliament, their rights in the workplace, and in all aspects of society. However, I would like to close this afternoon's debate on a positive note by illuminating the numerous successes of inspirational Scottish women in sport so far this year. And I know that speakers in today's debate have highlighted many of their successes, and the Minister, in his opening remarks, spoke with pride of some of their um, achievements. In April of this year at the Commonwealth Games, we had the privilege of witnessing a new generation of Scottish women competing and winning in their respective sports against some of the most experienced and the most respected athletes in the world. In Gold Coast, the women of Team Scotland returned two gold medals, five silver medals and six bronze medals. And our gold medal winners included Kate Archibald in the individual pursuit and Grace Reid in the diving one metre springboard. Our silver medal winners included Hannah Miley, who's already been mentioned, Neve Evans, Ailey Doyle, Caroline Brown, Kay Moran, Stacey McDougall, and Kate Archibald added to our gold medal with a silver in the points race. And our bronze medal winners included Linda Pearson, um, Shona McIntosh, Claire Johnson, Leslie Doig, Kirsty Gilmer, and Neve, Eden, Neve Evans. And in the summer, there was further success as Inverness-born Lauren Muir became the first British woman to win the European 1500 metre title at the European Championships in Berlin. And in September, the Scottish women's national team secured qualification for the FIFA Women's World Cup for the first time. And presiding officer, to achieve gender parity in sports participation, we must redouble our efforts to ensure that organised sport is more accessible and more inclusive for young women and girls. The increasing visibility of Scottish women in sport is extremely positive, and I am extremely hopeful that the myriad of success achieved by Scottish sportswomen throughout 2018 can act as a catalyst which inspire our country stars of the future. Our next Gemma Fay, our next Katie Archibald, and our next Laura Muir. Thank you. We just got to finishing post in time. Uh, I call on Rachel Hamilton to close with Conservatives. Seven minutes, please, Ms Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to close today in what's been a, a really, really good debate. And on behalf of my Scottish uh, Conservative colleagues, uh, we wanted to mark um, and be involved in the Women and Girls in Sport Week. From my own experience of sport, it's vitally important for physical and mental health and it encourages creation of friendships, teamwork, national pride and community spirit. I could hear the pride in everyone's voices today and I would like to uh, take this opportunity on everyone's behalf of, to thank our Scottish sportswomen who do so much for our country. My constituency is in the Scottish borders, as many of you know, and it is a loft with fantastic sportswomen. GB team in Scotland hockey midfielder Sarah Robertson from Selkirk, Sammy King Horn from Gordon, the fastest ever female British wheelchair racer, uh, regardless of classification, and freestyle swimmer Lucy Hope from Deborah, winning a gold medal at the 2018 European Aquatics Championships. Like many MSPs, I do try to get involved in supporting as many sporting groups as possible, whether it be playing women, uh, with the club at Kelso 
or like Liam MacArthur supporting Orkney Netball star Sarah McPhail's selection uh, to the Scotland under-21s, or George Adams supporting Paisley's women's football team. Claire Baker and Anna Sawa spoke of the Scottish Health Survey, and the fact remains that extensive research still shows low rates of women and girls participating in sport. Participation in sport by girls at a young age is crucial. Keeping that going is another. Angus MacDonald talked about um, the dropouts in sport and the retention problems that we do have. And barriers still exist for girls. A lack of self-esteem. Gillian Martin spoke about this. A lack of opportunities and or negative experience of school PE lessons. And I, I fondly um, listened to Alison Harris as she talked about cutting the oranges actually she was contrib contributing and I hope that she felt involved as well even if she didn't really like, like sport but everybody has a role including volunteers. Um, research shows girls are less positive about their school experiences of physical education than boys. We've also heard that today and according to a, a women in sports study published only last November 64% of girls said schools that their school encouraged them to take part in sport compared to 72% of boys. And evidence shows that as girls move into their teenage years, sport petition reduce, participation reduces and stays lower than boys. And we've got to break down these barriers. Nothing should hold girls uh, back from taking part in sport, regardless of where they live. And Finlay Carson um, spoke about the challenges of access in transport in his own constituency, which is a um, very rural area. Last year, Sports Scotland published eight recommendations, ranging from providing some single-sex opportunities to involving more women in the planning of sporting events. And we all welcome the Scottish Government announcement of the £2 million um, pounds to reduce inequalities in sport, including encouraging more women and girls into sport. Brian Whittle and the Scottish Conservatives argue that the goal must be equal access for all, irrespective of background or personal circumstance. And that includes, as I said earlier, getting it right between that right, the, the rural and urban divide. And many MSPs acknowledge that there aren't enough female coaches and role models. In fact, 31% of coaches across the UK are female. Sport Scotland is encouraging more co um, coaches to get involved by offering subsidies, but there is still a long way to go. And as we approach the midway point of a 10-year national strategy, um, entitled A More Active Scotland, the Scottish Government set, um, must set targets to close the physical activity uh, and the gender gap that I I is um, exposed within that, and we've heard that today. Alison Johnson talked about media co coverage, and she's right. Um, women's sport makes up only 7% of um, media coverage. Um, but I also had uh, learned of the excellent Girls Do Sport, which is a de development run by um, Scottish Women in Sport in collaboration with the University of the West of Scotland. And this is an ambitious new partnership, which will see 10 programmes created by students and graduates and staff at the university, focusing on women in sport and highlighting one sport per show. Many members today spoke about role models and the link between grassroots and elite sports. More screening and coverage of women's sports will allow um, more girls to see female role models and be inspired to pick up a racket or put on some football boots. Um, it was interesting to learn that the BBC have also committed to delivering a further 500 hours of live women's sports coverage. And I hope to catch the um, Netball World Cup final next year, which they've promised to uh, televise. Um, to conclude, uh, presiding officer, we, we agree on the Conservative benches that sport for women and girls is a must, and it must be more accessible. We still have a long way to go. Poverty is a key determining factor, and there is a link between deprivation and low participation. Barriers also include a lack of transport, the cost of transport, or issues with uh, venue access or venue hire, lack of equipment. Um, extracurricular activities rely on volunteers, and volunteers are key to delivering sport uh, with of those two hours that are currently delivered in schools. More must be done to encourage vol volunteer participation. And more must be done to establish a stronger bond between grassroots and elite sports. Role models are also key. Finally, the Scottish Government acknowledged that sport and physical health improves health and well-being and improves self-esteem. It's now time for the Minister to galvanise the support he has seen today and he's heard from all parties. It's time for lasting change, not just for women and girls, but for everybody.
Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call Marie Todd to close for the Government Minister till decision time, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I very much welcome the contributions made from across the Chamber, but before I may, um, reflect on the points made during the debate, I'd like to say just how pleased I am that during our Year of Young People we continue to find ways to celebrate having young people's voices heard and to be participants in shaping and driving change. Throughout this Women and Girls in Sport Week, I've been struck by the many great examples of girls who've built confidence, who've made friendships, built resilience and gained skills through physical activity or sport. And I look forward very much tomorrow to visiting Broughton High School um, for their Active Girls Day and to hear direct from the girls the difference it's made to them. A joined-up approach working collaboratively across government departments, across sectors and across barriers will ensure that we continue to improve opportunities for girls and women right across Scotland. Today is another great opportunity to explore how together we can make Scotland an ACE-aware nation. We're committed to embedding an understanding of ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, across all of government and working collaboratively to drive progress across Scotland. Mitigating ACEs and supporting resilience is absolutely crucial to reduce the risk of people with ACEs experiencing negative long-term impacts and to break the cycle of future ACEs in the next generation. And there's really good evidence that participation in sport builds resilience and mitigates adverse childhood experiences. There's growing interest in emerging practice in the Scottish Sports Centre to sector to provide sport and physical activity opportunities that take account of ACEs and to allow young people to build their resilience. For example, Active schools teams in some local authorities have programmes specifically designed for girls who are vulnerable or who have disengaged from school, combining youth work approaches with carefully structured sport and physical activity opportunities. The Women and Girls in Sport Advisory Board are very keen to have some conversations with different age groups to fully understand the issues. Consultation is really important to provide a platform for girls and women to have their voices heard. And it'll help shape in and influence opportunities and recommendations on what more this government can do and empower girls and women to overcome the barriers. Now, like others in the chamber, I'm going to take the opportunity to talk about my own sporting prowess. But like Gillian Martin, my own sporting prowess is much more of the fine example of enthusiastic um, joining in over skill. My passion for rugby started when I was young, although I didn't play it until my 20s, uh, when the hospital I worked in had a team. I gave it a try and I found I absolutely loved the physicality. I loved the teamwork and I loved the body confidence that came from playing. As Liam MacArthur said, rugby is a sport for all shapes and sizes. I also agree with Liam MacArthur that the Or Orkney Dragons are an inspirational team and Jo Ingster, the captain that he referenced, is a case in point. She was a rugby mum who took up the sport in her late 30s and led her team to a meteoric rise, lifting silverware within a very short time from starting. There are other inspirational women in my sport. Jade Kinkell was the first ever professional female rugby player in Scotland. Um, Dee Bradbury, um, who we've heard of before, who's the, who's the most amazing woman who first excelled in athletics, Brian Whittle sport, and then switched code in her late 30s to rugby. These are strong, fearless women who are participating and excelling in a physical, in fact, a contact sport, pioneers, trailblazers, and role models for all of us. I have to say Mary Fee and uh, Alison Harris would be very welcome in the Scottish Parliament rugby team, which I, I now play in, even if it's just to cut oranges. Um, you can come along and share in the camaraderie because one of the other joys of sport, which we haven't mentioned so far today, is how it can bring together people of very different backgrounds and beliefs. And the fact that I play in a team alongside the Tory front bench is a very fine testament to that. 
And before I leave the subject of Scottish rugby, I have to commend the partnership between Scottish rugby and girl guiding. It's a fabulous collaboration which brings together two of my favourite things. And I hope that we see more links like this in future. Brian Whittle's speech um, gave us an, an insight into his long passion and involvement in sport, but also gave us a wonderful insight into how far we've come. Anna Sarwar, I have to say, I can personally commend the Daily Mile to you and others in the chamber. It's a very easy way for us all to get our exercise in. As Claire Baker rightly mentioned, it started um, near where you are, where you're based, and it's become a worldwide phenomenon. Alison Johnson and Alison Harris both were absolutely right about the coverage in the media of women's sport. It's a huge bugbear for me and other women in the chamber, and I agree that it's absolutely vital for this to improve if participation is to improve. Jenny Gilruth and Brian Whittle rightly made the link between sport and closing the attainment gap, and I'm very pleased to hear that this is being widely recognised. It was an excellent speech from Jenny Gilruth, and, and I loved that she highlighted the Scottish women football um, leading the way in ethical sport sponsorship. Finn Carson quite rightly highlighted the particular challenges that rural athletes face and as a Highlands and Islands MSP and indeed as a Highlands and Islands mum I know very well um, the situation. I would say that the growth and flourishing of Shinty might well be, um, women's Shinty might well be an example of how things can be improved in other parts of the country. Sandra White um, mentioned a lovely project, the Bike Store project which highlighted that it's never too late to take up a new sport and learn a new skill, and that camaraderie is one of the greatest benefits we get from sport. Gillian Martin made some very fine points about active travel, and the £80 million investment this year in this year's budget was a doubling of investment, and it will make a huge difference, but there is absolutely always more that we can do. Several people um, mentioned the situation with female coaches, and you're absolutely correct. Only 31% of coaches right across the UK are women. We recognise the need for more female coaches and sporting leaders to attract the next generation into sport. Sports Scotland recognised this, and from 2016 to 18, they provided financial subsidies to support coaches to gain coaching qualifications, with only 50 over 50% of them being women. It's also key that we enable our young female sporting leaders to shine. And the Sports Scotland Young People's Sports Panel boasts a really impressive 14 female members out of the 19 panel members. We welcome very much the positive trend in the overall measure of physical activity amongst adults since 2012 in the recent health survey and a wide range of organisations in Scotland are working very hard to encourage and support people in Scotland to be more active more often enabling more people to experience the many physical and mental health benefits of being um, active. The Scottish Government's emphasis on the importance of empowering communities is important here. When communities feel empowered, evidence shows that this leads to increased confidence and skills, more people volunteering, greater satisfaction with quality of life in the neighbourhood and greater engagement in local democracy. Access to opportunities to highlight the many benefits of physical activity and sport is a right that we want everyone to have. Achieving our vision of a Scotland where people are more active more often is therefore both an outcome of following these principles and a means of advancing these principles in their own right. If we work together in driving forward these improvements, we'll drive forward change for women and girls right across Scotland, providing them with every opportunity to participate. I thank you all for your contributions to this debate today and the contribution that it's made to raising awareness and discussing the opportunities in sport and physical activity among women and girls. I'd like to finish by reminding you all though that we are all leaders in this chamber. So let's see what we can do, not just to talk about this, but to actually 
do it, and to paraphrase George Adam, I think we should not just spectate, let's participate. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on Women and Girls in Sport Week. The next item of business is consideration of motion 14208 in the name of Derek Mackay on appointments to the Scottish Fiscal Commission. And I call on Derek Mackay to move the motion. Move. Thank you very much. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau motion 14211 on designation of a lead committee. And could I ask Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau to move the motion? Moved, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. We turn now to decision time. The first question is that amendment 14194.1 in the name of Brian Whittle, which seeks to amend motion 14194 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on women and girls in sport week be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that amendment 14194.2 in the name of Anas Sarwar, which seeks to amend motion in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the next question is that motion 14194 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick as amended on Women and Girls in Sport Week be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that motion 14208 in the name of Derek Mackay on appointments to the Fiscal Commission be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And our final question is that motion 14211 in the name of Graham Day on designation of a lead committee be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. That concludes decision time. I look forward to welcoming members back after recess and I close this meeting. <laughs>